whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no heart, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death. Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. I'm Lindsay, the college kid. Oh, you're a college kid today. I'm college kid today. What uh, What year are you? Mm, whatever year I want to be. Yeah? Yeah. You know, like just I'm just playing it fast and loose. You know oh, what I mean? Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. On campus or off campus? Mm, depends on the night. Oh, interesting. <laughs> uh, last uh, oh. Tuesday night episode for February. I know, crazy. Mm-hmm, it is. See ya, February. <laughs> uh, spooky and cute, till death do us part. Kind of Valentine's-y. Uh, scared to death shirt in the store at badmagicmerch.com. I know Valentine's Day is past Doesn't now, matter. Love is enduring. Love is, in, is, is eternal. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this one feels more peeper than creep. Mm. I, I like the mix we've had lately. Yeah. I like what you're wearing, the Crystal crystal Queen. I know, I love this. Well, this, okay, so I intentionally ordered it too big so mm-hmm. that I could rock the, like, oversized yeah. sweatshirt trend. And then I was like, oh, I feel like I'm going to college. So mm-hmm. I had to prep it up a little bit. Nice. I'm, I'm the least bit preppy, but this is my attempt. Uh, it looks good. It, yeah. you, it works. It works. It's cozy. It's like a really nice champion sweatshirt. That's cozy. I really kind of broke out of my, um, you know, kind of fashion norm today, and I'm wearing mm-hmm. um, track pants and a t-shirt. Oh my god! Yeah, for like That's the first so t- different for like the first time since I don't know two days ago. Wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I love that every day you basically look like a Russian mobster. <laughs> like my favorite is when you have on your black track pants uh-huh. and a black t-shirt uh-huh. and white sneakers yeah. and a black jacket. Hell yeah! Oh, it's mm-hmm. so good. Mm-hmm. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Just some gold chains. And... Uh, why not? Yeah. Give me some gold chains. Yeah. Give me some bling. Uh, <laughs> store at badmagicproductions.com for customer uh, uh, service if you have any questions about the merch. Okay. Um, thanks again to the Roberts and Annabelles who are part of the Bad Magic Productions family for both uh, employing us, helping us donate mm-hmm. $12,200 to nokidhungry.org this month. Good job. You know what I did with the Annabelles this month? What? You don't know? I don't. Oh, well, let me tell you. We did a super fun thing. Mm-hmm. Where it was the first 50 people to answer some trivia oh, yeah. questions correctly mm-hmm. in the mail. They got, uh, like, last week or two weeks ago, I was wearing, like, a teeny tiny, super cute little Annabelle button. Mm-hmm. I found out it's a button, not a pin. There's a difference. Yep. Um, and so if you were of the first 50 people to get it right, I wrote you a little handwritten note and sent mm-hmm. you an Annabelle pin. Well, that's very button, nice. Button. Well, good, good, good for you. It was so fun. <laughs> I know. I heard people. I, I do remember now. You're yes, talking about okay. it. And people I talk very about a lot of things. You true, know what we I mean? have a lot of stuff going on. I can never, can never like, hey, keep Dan. track. Hey, Dan. Hey, Dan. Hey, Dan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm like a kid. You are. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's you and you and Kyler for the most part. It's like, mm-hmm. hey, da, 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 just jumping in with and crazy Penny, no, and Penny. Non, non sequiturs. And I'm always like, wait, give me, give me 10 seconds of transition. Kyler and I just transition faster. We can like jump like this. Speaking, of, speaking of transition, let me get to... Uh, NoKidHungry.org, the website I was going to mention oh. that we have in the episode description if others would like to donate. I gotta keep you focused today. You got cap- do you have coffee this morning? No. I have a decaf. Mm, okay. How many stories do you have today, I have Lulu? Two. I have two, Dan. <laughs> okay. Do you want to give us any... Um... I, I feel like I'm in trouble. No. I was trying to focus you. Do you, you have any previews about the sorry, two? You said you said Annabelle's and I wanted to talk about the cool thing I did. I didn't know that you were going to keep going. Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, I just have two stories. And uh, our first story, yeah, I, I found it really um, kind of like different in the mm-hmm. sense that the history of the person telling the story is that they're a paranormal investigator and their parents were paranormal investigators. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I thought so too. So I don't want to tell you too, too much about that. It's just something about one of their investigations. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, a situation where you're going to wonder what's going on. Like, is a house haunted or is a person haunted? Like, it's it's pretty a pretty interesting story. And, and your stories are, uh, you said, a little bit longer this week than they normally are, correct? Yeah, nice and, nice and meaty. I nice. Think. What do you have? My stories, I, I think they're mm, maybe a little bit shorter than normal this week. I well, have a, okay. two more traditional type tales. Okay. Uh, two reportedly haunted places. The first we've been to together several times, LA's Griffith Park. Oh, it's haunted? Yeah, supposedly very haunted. Home of the famous, you know, Griffith Observatory, the yeah. Hollywood sign, and apparently lots of spirits. Dang. And then we're going to head away from the big city to small town Kansas mm. and visit the Stoll Cemetery, 
home reportedly to one of the seven mouths of hell. Whatever the fuck that means. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> hell and Hollywood. Well, they that's, do go hand in hand. That's what's on the docket today. Okay. Uh, are you ready to head back to L.A. where we used to live? Yeah, but can I talk about my socks for a second? You can I'll be yeah, quick. Yeah, sure. Look how cute these are. They're pink, and they have like a little, um, can you see? Little little eye, like Illuminati yeah, eye? Yeah, like holding the eye in the hand. It says, look within. Ooh. I know, I dig Kind of a ones. culty. They're nice. I know. I dig cult stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay, now I'm ready. <laughs> uh, okay, Griffith Park. And again, we've uh, been to that many times, uh, you know, great for hiking, all kinds of stuff. One of the largest urban parks in the U.S., 4,210 acres of rocky, rubble-strewn mountains and uh, slopes over six and a half square miles, a zoo, an observatory, museums, an amphitheater dot the park's borders, uh, but its interior rugged, remote, and full of past tragedy. Former Griffith Park Chief Ranger Albert Torres, who passed away in 2019, once warned visitors to stay away from the interior of the park at night, saying, if you knew even a quarter of the stuff we find within the park's perimeter, you'd never set foot in it again. Animal sacrifices, satanic cults, murders, stuff like that happening on a regular basis. The Hillside Strangler serial killer, uh, serial killers, used to dump the bodies of some of their victims in the park. In 2012, two women walking their dog on one of the park's hiking trails below the Hollywood sign found a severed head wrapped in a plastic bag. A day later, investigators scouring the scene found more body parts, a right hand, some feet buried in a shallow grave. In 2010, hikers found a man's skull on one of the park's trails, the Skyline Trail. Bodies or parts of bodies are found in the park somewhat regularly. Many of them the remains of murder victims, some of them possibly sacrifices. And in addition to being a true crime hotspot, the park also long rumored to be both cursed and haunted. A curse was supposedly placed over 150 years ago, way back in 1775. Some cool history here before we get into the story, Mm -hmm. the scary story. Uh, Jose Vicente Files, a Spanish soldier set out from present day Arizona, joining one of the first Spanish expeditions into present day California. He made it to the San Gabriel Mission. The next year, the mission that was founded in 1771, uh, in 1781, Files was still stationed at the San Gabriel Mission when a group of 44 settlers arrived on their way to found a new city further south, what would turn into Los Angeles. He helped plan and oversee the new community until around 1800, and when he retired, the Spanish king, Carlos III, rewarded him with a land grant of 6,647 acres Rancho Nuestra Señora de Refugio de los Files, Ranch of Our Lady of Refuge of the Files family. The grant comprised what is today Los Files, East Hollywood, Silver Lake, and Griffith Park. I love all those places. <laughs> and the land would stay in the Files family for many, many years, and then according to legend, it was stolen from them, and that theft is the source of the curse. Time now for the tale of the curse of Griffith Park. Eventually... It became the land became the property of Don Antonio Files, ancestor of the uh, you know explorer we just mentioned or descendant, excuse me, who resided on the land with his housekeeper and his niece Dona Petronilla towards the end of his life. In 1863, as the Don lay dying of smallpox, an influential local politician, former mayor of Los Angeles and future California State Treasurer Antonio F. Cornell came up to draw Files's will. And according to legend, when he and his lawyer met with Don Anton- Antonio. The man was near death and delirious, and they took advantage of his confused state. Allegedly, Cornell and his lawyer tricked Don Antonio into signing the ranch over to Cornell. And when Don Antonio's niece, Petronia, found out, she was infuriated, of course, and cursed the former mayor. She reportedly swore, The substance of the Files family shall be your curse. The wrath of heaven and the vengeance of hell shall fall upon this place. The curse of the Files may, of course, be nothing but a myth, but it is true that the ranch would become, or that would become Griffith Park, changed hands at an alarming rate over the next 30 years, and its many owners kept meeting nasty fates. Cornell swiftly ceded the property to his lawyer for cash, and then the attorney was soon shot and killed while celebrating the sale of the land's water rights. Huh. The next owner attempted to turn the ranch into a dairy business, but the cattle sickened and died, and grasshoppers and fires demolished the crops that were then tried to be, uh, you know, uh, farmed at the ranch. During the tenure of its last owner, Griffith J. Griffith, (laughs) such an odd name, name. (laughs) a lightning storm brought down huge stands of trees and sent a wall of water cascading through the canyons, ruining much of the ranch. According to the book, Victorian Los Angeles, 
Ranch hands claim they saw Felix's ghost during the flood, cheering the successor's demise. <laughs> <Love Right? it. laughs> uh, afterward, Griffith supposedly would only visit the property during the day, and in 1896, apparently having decided that the land was more trouble than it was worth, he donated it to Los Angeles as a Christmas present. And that donation would not spare Griffith from darkness. A few years later, Griffith would go to prison for shooting his wife in the face one night in Santa Monica. Rude. She would incredibly survive the attack, although she lost her right eye, mm. was horribly disfigured. Yeah. She would later say at the trial for this assault and attempted murder that Griffith suffered from paranoid delusions. Could his paranoia and violence somehow be connected to some dark influence from the park? Once Griffith Park was in public hands, stories of the Feliz's curse continued. The curse was blamed after 29 civilian Conservation Corps workers died in the park in a 1933 wildfire. Multiple other random tragedies were added to the curse legend over the years, like the very strange death of a young couple, 22-year-old musician Randy Garrett, Garrett and aspiring actress Nancy Jeanson, only 20, uh, both allegedly crushed to death by a falling tree while making love on a park picnic table in 1976. Dang. Morris Carl, a city tree trimmer, was assigned with the job of cleaning up the tree that killed the couple a few days after their bodies were found. And he said that when he tried to clear the debris, he had problems starting his chainsaw. He was overcome with the most intense case of chills he'd ever had. And while trying to figure out what was wrong with the chainsaw, he claimed to have heard a voice speak to him from the air behind him, leave us alone. Oh my God. Freaked out, he headed back to his truck where he said he found written on the dust on his windshield the words, next time you die. What? Then he hightailed it out of there, never went back. One of so many stories. Many of the stories seem to center around one of the world's most recognizable signs. The famous Hollywood sign sits on the western frontier of Griffith Park and paranormal sightings stemming from real life tragedy surround it. The most well-known of the park spirits, seen multiple times over many years around the sign, believed to be the ghost of Peg Entwistle. In 1932, the distraught young actress leapt to her death from the H. Mm. And soon after, people staring at the sign after dark started reporting seeing a young woman seen jumping from the H who would then vanish before hitting the ground. Other sightings described to Entwistle's ghost include those of a woman matching her description and period clothes wandering along the park trails as well as walking up the path between the sign and her former residence on Beechwood Drive. The smell of gardenias, her perfume scent of choice, has been reported to linger near her spirit sightings. Several of the sightings have come from various park rangers who've claimed to witness a pretty blonde dressed in 1930s outfits roaming around the park grounds. The rangers have described her looking sad. Every time she's approached, she vanishes. She's been reportedly seen by so many Numerous local residents, in addition to the rangers, have claimed to witness this apparition. A couple walking their dog along the Beechwood Canyon Trail of the park found their pet whimpering, cowering all of a sudden. Soon a woman appeared in the trail ahead of them. She was clad in the same outdated clothes, reportedly looked very confused, and then vanished. Beechwood Canyon resident Devin Morgan says she once also spotted this spirit. One afternoon during her usual exercise hike along the trail, she believed she saw Peg's ghost up ahead. Morgan told a reporter later, she looked very strange to me. She had a very etheric quality. Instead of walking, she seemed to almost glide. She wasn't floating. She didn't look like she was a ghost, but there was something very, very strange about her. Very soft looking. Morgan attempted to catch up with this woman, but then she vanished. And the only thing in her place was the intense scent of gardenias. Hmm. On an episode of the Sci-Fi Channel's Paranormal Witness, which ran from 2011 through 2016, a young man claimed he'd seen this ghost as well. He and three friends decided one night to trespass and touch the famous Hollywood sign. After jumping fences, on their way back down, one of them slipped and fell on a little stretch of the hill. While trying to make his way back to the others, he saw someone walking towards him. Uh, he said uh, it was this woman wearing a dress similar to the style of the 1930s. She wore heels and a veil over her face. She walked effortlessly up the hill. Her footsteps made no sound. And he claimed it was only after this incident that he learned of Peg's tragic story. And then there is the stories that surround the Griffith Park merry-go-round. Oh, yeah. Uh, Louis Alvarado, the honorary mayor of Griffith Park back in 2016, reportedly encountered a ghost there on two separate occasions. One night while checking to help ensure all visitors had left the park at the sunset closing time, 
Alvarado watched as a man came down off of one of the carousel's wooden horses, only to disappear soon after walking away from the merry-go-round. Alvaro said he looked around to see if perhaps the man had disappeared in, like behind a tree but could find no trace of him. A few nights later, Alvarado was spooked when he said this scene repeated itself. Now, Alvarado, not the only one to claim, seen something spooky by the old merry-go-round that's been in Griffith Park since 1937. A woman claims that decades ago, when she was a teenager living nearby with her family, her and a friend snuck into the park late one night. This is back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And they say that suddenly, uh, when they were walking by, the carousel lit up on its own. (gasps) The old wooden horses started moving around to the music of the carousel. As they hid behind some bushes and watched after about two or three rotations, she said they both witnessed a dark figure suddenly riding atop one of the old oh, wooden horses. God. Uh, so they see nothing, and then all of a sudden this figure comes rotating around. <sighs> At first they think they must have imagined it because when it rode around back out of their line of sight, there was nothing on the horses for the next rotation or two. But then the shadowy rider returned. Oh my gosh. And this time they say when we rode back into their line of sight, the carousel suddenly stopped. The rider stood up off its horse, began to walk off the carousel directly towards them. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Then she claims the lights and the music of the carousel went out. Now they were alone in the dark with whatever they had just seen oh, get off this horse. You better get the fuck out of there. The two girls ran as fast as they could back towards the story posters nearby house and have wondered ever since who the phantom rider was. The ghost of Don Antonio, something to do with the old curse, the ghost of Griffith J. Griffith, the ghost of one of the many bodies found in the park over the years, or something else entirely. Some creature of the night who never once walked the earth as anything human. Bah. It's so crazy that I lived there for a Mm -hmm. decade and I never, ever heard anyone ever once say that they thought Griffith Park was haunted. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, like, what was it, like, weirdla.com, I want to say. Uh-huh. And and, and just a lot of stories out there. And and also, I mean, one of the um, sources for a lot of this information was actually the Washington Post. Hysterical. You know, just doing a little bit more... um, investigative journalism into like su- the supposed origins of some of the stories sure but a lot what i found the most interesting about this was all of the stories that surrounded the uh the actress mm-hmm. you know like seeing that one and i now i'm just kicking myself i should have put a picture of her in i did not that's okay but um easy to find if anybody wants to google that peg and whistle i mean yeah. there's tons of you know pictures of her from way back when on the web mm-hmm. but but i thought that was interesting and then it was like uh, visitors to the park. It was people who lived in the canyons around the park, uh-huh. and also lots of park rangers. Right, um, right. So yeah. yeah, just a lot of sightings over many, many, many years. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that area. If we go back many, many stories ago, we had that how uh, like the not the murder uh, house. Uh, yes, the Los Feliz. I think it was called the Los Feliz Murder House. I or think something. so. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think so. You know, like my friends live just mm-hmm. a few doors down from there, and it's all. I mean, if. If you've never been there or you're not familiar with the area, it's all sort of interconnected and there's just this long stretch and it sort of starts yeah. at Beachwood, Beachwood Canyon, which like down by like La Poubelle and... Yeah, you know that area is so much better mm-hmm. than I do. Yeah, it sort of like starts there. You know, you're... So it's like almost like the freeway is here and then it breaks into this neighborhood kind of here and it all goes through the hills and because it's all built up, right? Yeah. Like you can't really recognize it um, from just as you're driving by. And then once you hit the entrance to Griffith Park, it's like Griffith Park entrance is here. But if you kept going, then you would hit like the Greek theater right. and it all just kind of like. If you can just imagine, it's really spread out at the bottom mm-hmm. and then kind of all converges at the top. It's, yeah. it's a very interesting area how it all twists and winds. Yeah. And But I never heard a story. I never saw anything. I've hiked there. I have stayed at friends' houses up <laughs> there. Just no, I've heard none of this. I like the history of it. I, I like that this one guy uh, had a ranch at one time that mm-hmm. encompassed, you know, Los Feliz and Silver Lake and East Hollywood and yeah. Griffith Park. I mean, so much land. It's just yeah. funny to think about that as a ranch now. Yeah. Had you ever gone to the zoo there yes i can't picture it i know where like the ride the ponies thing is i don't yeah i don't know where well well, i actually i i say i've I've been to the zoo in los angeles but i don't remember if that was at the edge of griffith park or not oh i guess it is the way it kind of wraps oh that's how big it is huge huge yeah yeah i've been to like the the christmas lights in griffith park i've been to the there's the train. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, it's a really impressive piece of property that they've developed in a lot of yeah. different ways. I have some pictures here. Sure. The first one is just of Griffith Park. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, part of it there. You can see the observatory in the distance. You can right, see, see the the LA. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Further out. Uh, sometimes I really miss it. 
Yeah. It's easy to miss when you don't have to put up with the traffic. Right. Well, and we've walked up to Griffith Park numerous times. I think about with Date and Bree and some yeah, of those just friends. Recently, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And there I, is a lot of just, I can imagine it at night. Mm-hmm. You know, and actually, this next picture is the darkness of the, the park at night. It's interesting that you're so close to LA, uh-huh. but I mean, so close, right there. You, I mean, you are surrounded. in LA County. Yeah. Yeah. And you're surrounded by city, but then it's just, you know, dark woods at night. Yeah. Yeah. Hollywood is like just below that. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Have, uh, have, we've well, you've actually, been up there at night with me, right? Uh, yes, the observatory. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yes. And I've taken my mom. Uh, and then this next picture is of uh, part of the park and the Hollywood sign. Mm-hmm. Isn't part of it such an iconic sign? But again, here you can see. You know, there is city right... Whoever's taking that picture right behind them is so much city. Mm -hmm. And then you look forward and there's just all this, you know, undeveloped land. It's just interesting. Yeah, and it It, couldn't be developed. Yeah, yeah. too mountainous. And it's Mm -hmm. just so different than like Central Park, Mm -hmm. which is... There's no houses on it, but it is a park. This is just wild land. Right, open terrain. Yeah, exactly. In the middle of so much city. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, and, it is very cool. And then this next picture is that supposedly haunted picnic table in Griffith Park with the tree there. I wonder so exactly weird. where that is because there is a little restaurant in the park too, the Oaks. It's oh, like yeah. you could get like sandwich, salad, mm-hmm. coffee kind of thing. Restrooms are there. Uh, and then two more pictures. This next one's the merry-go-round, which I for totally forgot about even existing there. Random trivia about that merry-go-round. Uh, that merry-go-round uh, part, partly inspired Walt Disney to build Disneyland. Fun. Yeah. That's cool. And then uh, another, this last picture is just of one of the carousels, you know, old horses. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was, yeah, showed up in Griffith Park in 1937, but it was actually, this carousel is even older. It was in San Diego. Oh, uh, and it was for, moved? Mm-hmm, for like 14 years before that. That's cool. Yeah. It is amazing how they do stuff like that. Like, there's a carousel. Right. You know the carousel in downtown Coeur d'Alene over yeah. by Fort Grounds? Mm-hmm. It used to be on the like the pier on the boardwalk, sort of like oh. the boardwalk marina. I mean, it just seems like such a massive undertaking to move something like that. Oh yeah, just I taking mean, it, it is, but taking it apart and then reassembling it. Just yeah. like I think about you know, like assembling like IKEA furniture and how <laughs> and frustrating how we can't that can do that. Be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well also <laughs> those imagine, directions aren't great. Uh, <laughs> I can't imagine deconstructing in a, a giant carousel and then reconstructing it somewhere else. Listen, I can't even change my own oil. Like, mm. talk about basic things of taking something apart and putting it back together. I can't do that. And neither one of us are mechanical wizards. Well, no one ever taught me. Oh, man. So, how come you don't uh, know? Your dad? I know some him? things. I'm handier than you okay. on some of those things. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, yeah, I just didn't have the interest. My dad, I mean, he never really, like, to set aside time to teach me. Sure. But, I, but I, he would hire me as a laborer for, you know, work, and then I would just learn little things here and there on the job site. Would he disappear? Like, do you even know where he really was? Oh, yeah, to go with the time second uh, uh, accusations. Right. You know what? He w- actually would leave the job site for hours at I a time. I he would. Mm-hmm. Supposedly going to the lumber mill or whatever, but then he wouldn't bring back lumber. So, you know, he could have been doing something. He could have been, I mean, I don't know who disappeared in that area when my dad know. was not at the job. Yeah. <sighs> That's a whole other thing. If anybody's really confused right now, uh, I've, I've, I don't want to say accusations, but I've been putting some pieces together in recent times, like episodes about, you know, my dad's a mysterious guy mm-hmm. and a lot of people don't know where he goes sometimes. Mm-hmm. So what's that about? What's that about? <sighs> Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Your poor dad. <laughs> are you ready to move on to Hellmouth? Yeah. I mean, this is so weird. I've never heard of, what was it? The seven mouths of hell? Mm-hmm, I had neither. I've never heard that phrase. I, I hadn't either. I, li- I like it, though. That's sounds like cool. A, sounds like a great, like, metal album name, The Seven Mouths of Hell. I was thinking that it could be the inspiration for a really fucking cool tattoo. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Not my tattoo. But... <laughs> Maybe mine. Maybe. Now we head to Kansas. Off we go. Uh, off we go. I'd like to thank, spa- uh, you know, uh, I almost said the wrong thing. Space Lizard. Mm-hmm. I'd like to thank Scared to Death fan <laughs> Alexander Dahl, who I'm guessing is a creeper, uh, for sending this story our way. Stole Kansas uh, Hellmouth is what we're going to be talking about here. They say that under the ruins atop the former basement of an abandoned church in Stole, Kansas, there exists a sealed staircase Ooh. that is almost impossible to find, and you don't want to find it. If you do, uh, and you follow that staircase down far enough on the wrong night, legend has it you can reach one of these seven mouths of hell itself. And if you do, good luck ever getting back out. A little over five miles west of Lawrence, home of the University of Kansas, the Jayhawks, a rather desolate-looking little burg, sits at the intersection of North 1600 Road and County Road 1023. Not much there. Two old churches, a few scattered houses, a long abandoned store, and a graveyard. The old cemetery is checkered with dove gray and weathered tombstones. 
and the top, the crest of a little hill, the cemetery uh, is built on, there now lies a mound of rubble. All that remains of a small country chapel that once stood there. This is Stoll, believed by some to be one of the seven mouths of hell. Stories of the devil have haunted Stoll for roughly a century. Hmm. The settlement was founded sometime in about 1856, a supply stop in between Topeka and Lawrence, named after its first postmaster, Sylvester Stoll. The members of the early community were deeply religious, and they sought to construct a place of Christian worship. And in 1867, using funds they pooled together, they were able to erect a small limestone chapel on Emanuel Hill. Two years after the church was built, a local man named Edwin Hildebrand donated land so that the chapel might have an accompanying cemetery. Evangelical Emanuel Church would remain in use for over 50 years until 1922 when it was abandoned and left to the elements. And soon after, spooky stories began to surround the abandoned building directly above a field of tombstones in the, most, in the mostly abandoned town, you know, just a few miles outside of the outer edge of Lawrence. Stoll fell into relative obscurity. No more than a few dozen families lived there. And according to legends, some of those families may not have stopped going to the cemetery church after it was abandoned. Some may have continued to hold masses, just praying now to a different god. According to Stoll's paranormal mythology, practitioners of the occult began to hold black masses, many of them, and actually connect with dark spirits from the other side. That's a bad idea. Some suspect that early residents, Betty and Frankie Thomas, were among those practitioners. There was once a mighty pine tree on top of Emanuel Hill located next to the old church. And this tree, then considered the oldest and largest such specimen in Kansas, grew roots that cleaved the tombstone that marked the graves of Betty and Frankie Thomas in two. Some kind of omen? Stories have swirled for decades about the Thomases and others meeting in the ruins of the old uh, church for satanic rituals. Some rumors state that the church was never a place of true Christian worship and that from the very beginning, it was a house of the devil. Rumors regarding Stoll were only known to locals until November 5th, 1974, when the University of Kansas's student newspaper, the University Daily Kansan, ran an article titled, Legend of Devil Haunts Tiny Town. Time now for the tale of Stoll's Hellmouth. Citing local lore, article writer Jane Penner claimed that supernatural happenings often occurred in the graveyard, and then at midnight, on nights like Halloween and the spring equinox, and that those nights the devil himself would materialize in Stoll. The article included the testimony of several witnesses to strange happenings there. Rick Walker, an assistant Western civilization instructor, claimed that he had heard many tales of people going to Stoll and experiencing things like three- and four-hour lapses of memory. Julie Day, a freshman from Bonner Springs, recounted how she and her grandmother had once visited the cemetery, and lots of weird things happened, including the two of them sharing the same vision of a burning house where the abandoned church now stood. An anonymous University of Kansas student reported the following events in the student paper. He said that he and two of his fraternity brothers visited the Stoll Cemetery the year before. We decided to visit Stoll to find some excitement, he said. It was a beautiful night out, but as soon as we got to Stoll, it started raining. We sat in the car for a few minutes, then it stopped just as suddenly as it had started. It was weird, he said. The student said they got out of the car, started walking across the graveyard, and then all of a sudden, he says, I heard a noise behind me and I felt someone grab my arm. <gasps> I'll never forget how cold the fingers felt. He reported at first he thought it was one of his friends who had tripped, but when he turned around, both his friends were a good 25 yards behind him. Immediately after the University Daily Kansan article was printed, hundreds of curious individuals, most of them students, wandered into the sleepy town at night to see if they could spy the devil for themselves. On March 20th, 1978, for example, over 150 people showed up in mass at the cemetery, and more encounter stories followed the increase in visitors. Soon, stories emerged that Stoll was supposedly one of the seven gateways to hell. Carefully concealed in the old church basement was an incredibly well-hidden staircase fastened with a seal. And if one were unlucky enough to access the steps, time would begin to move at a supernatural slow rate. Following these steps would lead one directly to hell. As more stories emerged, the church became more and more associated with the occult. On October 31st, 1989, the Kansas City Star featured an article that claimed... The walls of the drafty church even bled during Lucifer's visit, further stating that the church was possessed by some sort of evil manifestation. Another article claimed that a large decaying crucifix bolted to the interior wall of the chapel had been witnessed by many turning itself upside down when visitors stepped in the building after midnight. 
Stories swirled around about the long abandoned church having been uh, the site of so many black masses held inside, so many that the structure itself had become possessed. So many of the stories are just odd as well. Two men claim that one calm night when they were visiting the cemetery, a strong wind blew up and frightened them into deciding to leave. When they got to the spot where they had parked their car, it wasn't there. It was now on the other side of the road, facing in the opposite direction. What? After the roof collapsed many years ago, it was said that no rain would fall inside the church no matter how badly the storm was blowing and raging outside. Another story that circulates is that when the church still stood on some nights, the church would light up with a glow from within, some type of unholy mass, and an eighth window would appear. Its appearance became associated as an omen of bad luck for the town of Stoll, or whoever was visiting the old church when they saw it, and disaster and tragedy would follow shortly after its appearance. On March 29, 2002, Good Friday, incidentally, the chapel was demolished after losing its roof and having one of its walls collapse. Some claimed that locals had it dismantled for fear that further falling debris would hurt or even kill someone. Others claimed that no one authorized the demolition, that one morning, the former church just suddenly lay in total ruins. However it was dismantled, today only a pitiful pile of rubble remains. And some think under that rubble still lies the Hellmouth. So why would the fallen son of heaven choose a desolate village in the middle of Kansas for one of seven supposed passageways to the underworld? According to legend, in the 1850s, the devil himself impregnated one of his local worshippers in Stull, and she bore him a monster that grew to be the gatekeeper of his fiery abode, a hellhound that still reportedly is sometimes witnessed prowling the cemetery grounds at night. On Halloween night of 1999, more mystery was added to the Stoll Chapel and Cemetery. Reporters from a local newspaper and television news crews joined a group of onlookers at the cemetery hoping to see something supernatural around midnight. No thanks. And then, at 11.30 p.m., an unknown representative for the cemetery owners appeared and ordered everyone to leave the property at once. The owners stated through their representative that they did not want media attention brought to the graveyard because it attracted vandals. But if they really didn't want extra attention, couldn't they have furthered their case, furthered their cause, by allowing the camera crew to stay just another half hour and show that the devil, nor any other ghostly apparitions, did appear around midnight, helping to debunk the legends? Why have everyone leave right before midnight? Despite the land's owners forbidding any midnight explorations, visitors do still sneak onto the grounds regularly at night. To this day, Skull it Stull is continually visited by ghost hunters, hoping to find proof of the paranormal. A few years ago, an anonymous web poster calling himself Jake said he was visiting his girlfriend Kay and her family in Lawrence for the holidays when they decided to go to nearby Stoll uh, later one evening. Kay only lived about 20 minutes away from the cemetery. Her dad, Trent, came along as well, the three of them heading to the old cemetery shortly after midnight, all ghost hunter enthusiasts. They parked next to the church across the street from the cemetery and snuck in. Trent warning them to be very quiet that local cops would cite them for trespassing if they were caught. Local residents had grown real sick of ghost hunters and would be quick to report them. When they stepped out of the car, Jake said the silence felt heavy, like weight in the air holding back even the wind. He said they left the car and crossed the street, quietly walked through the unlocked entrance into the cemetery. They passed by some of the graves, made it to the top of the hill to the rubble of the former church. They turned on their cell phone flashlights and searched a bit through the rubble, looking for the supposedly sealed staircase. They found some weird scratches on some of the stones along the front perimeter of the rubble. Too organized to be an animal, maybe made by some kids fooling around, they thought. They looked around for about 20, 30 minutes more, and then moved behind the church towards some creepy-looking dead trees. They heard a car approaching, turned off their flashlights on their cell phones, and that's when Jake noticed his battery was almost dead, even though he was sure he'd had a full charge when they showed up. He asked Kay and Trent. They both noticed the same thing. Oh, boy. All of their batteries almost completely dead, even though they'd only been there about a half hour. Then Trent's phone just shut itself off. A moment later, Kay's phone shut itself off as well. Then the three of them heard a strange sound, a low growling unnatural, coming from about 15 feet away, towards the back of the old church rubble. Jake went to turn his flashlight on and point it towards the sound, and when he did, they all briefly saw the dark shape of some kind of beast, before Jake's phone also shut itself off. The strange, low growling continued. Trent would later tell Jake uh, that he'd been in Kansas all his life, had spent a lot of time outdoors, he'd never heard a sound like that. 
The growling continued. Jake's hair stood on its ends. Then the three of them saw a faint glow from beneath the back of the rubble. Jake said he felt hypnotized. He wanted to go towards the rubble, find the source of the glow. He no longer cared about the growling. He said he felt like he fell into some kind of trance. He walked towards the ruins and started to move the heavy pieces of the old church walls. Trent and Kay, he no longer thought of them. It was like he was by himself. All that mattered was to make it to that glow. He started to move away the rubble. He had to find the seal. He had to find the stairs. Nothing else mattered. Jake! Trent was suddenly grabbing him and pulling him back. Let's go, he yelled, dragging on his arm. Then he was running with Trent and Kay back towards his car. They quickly started to pull away once they got inside, and as they did, Trent gasped, Oh my God, it's 3.30 a.m. We were there over three hours. Trent and Kay would later recall standing in place, feeling frozen for what felt like just a few moments, watching Jake move towards the rubble and try and move it, helpless to try and stop him, helpless apparently for hours, standing there in the dark. Luckily, it seems Jake still wasn't given enough time to do whatever he felt he needed to do. Did something want Jake to find that door? What stopped that from happening? What happened to the source of the growling? So many questions from that night, and Jake writes that the three of them who were there don't think they'll ever get any answers. He's just glad the three of them were able to drive home together that night. More mystery added to the strange legend of the Hellmouth in Stoll, Kansas. Ah. Just weird stories, collections Very of stories. weird. Mm-hmm. I have some pictures of this, of the rubble and everything. Okay, I'm kind of nervous. Uh, so this first picture is just the rubble, all that remains of the old Stoll Church. Oh, it literally is just a pile of rocks. Mm-hmm. All huh. caved in. And then uh, this next picture is going back a little further. This is just uh, after the roof came down, but the walls still stood. Mm-hmm. And then this next one comes from another story that the story itself wasn't like a great, like kind of narrative story. Okay. But essentially, this story was some other people, you know, there late at night. They he heard some weird rustling in one of the trees behind the church, mm -hmm. kind of those dark, weird trees that uh, Jake was talking about. They took this picture with their flesh, and it's just a fucking creepy photo. Okay. They think that they they could see this weird shape in the tree that didn't look like an animal. They didn't feel like it was an animal. And then, well, we can just show the picture. It's circled. And if we can zoom in, I didn't mention to uh, Zach that we're maybe going to zoom in, so I don't know if we can. But there's like, if we can make that picture bigger at all, you can see it, it almost looks like a little face. Oh, oh there we go. Uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe I need to look at it on my phone. Shut yeah. It, from from closer up, it, it, it did look a little like, what is that? So anyway, there's a bunch of like weird little pictures posted and that was from Imager and just various like Reddit type threads and stuff of just... And what did they think that that was? Like a little face. I don't... When, you, when I zoomed in before... Did, yeah, did you do it on your computer? Like yeah, it, really, it on my phone. really, really close? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll have these pictures on the, uh, you know, Instagram and Facebook at Scared to Death Podcast. Yeah, you guys zoom in and tell us what you think you see. Where are the other six mouths of hell? You probably don't know that. I don't know. It just like... As you were telling the story, I'm like, I, where, where are they? Are they all in America? Like, are they all over the world? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. And, I feel and so how I are they chosen? And why are they chosen? And I don't know. What's the folklore behind it? I'm very curious. I mm. feel like there could be like a lot of other cool stories about. Right. And if they, like, they all open at once, what happens? And, you know. Oh, I'm sure there's, yeah, some kind of lore. Well, maybe there is. Sometimes, sometimes there's not. Sometimes there's just a legend, you know, that gets associated with one place. Right. I mean, and again, if you're like a new listener, you know, we're, we're well aware that a lot of this stuff could just be like creepypasta or made mm -hmm. up. We, we don't know. You know, we don't like verify, fact check. So I don't know if there are. If we fact checked this show, it would be so <laughs> not fun. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, this is definitely suspension of uh, disbelief. Uh, I don't know if there's what kind of lore exists out there about other Hellmouths. I just like that term. That was what drew me to the story. Um, I mean, Stoll also, great name for a creepy little town. I know. Is it, how's it spelled? Stoll, S-T-U-L-L. -L. Oh, okay. I was spelling like, it like... Almost like Skull. I was spelling S-T-A-H-L, like Stoll. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Stoll, Kansas. Uh, randomly, there was a, <laughs> a band, Urge Overkill. They were like an alt band in the 90s. Okay. And one of their album covers features this cemetery in the old church. It does? Mm-hmm. Huh, I don't know that band. Would I know, would I know any of their songs? You... The only song you would probably maybe know them from is they did a cover uh, of "Girl, You'll Be a, You'll Be a Woman Soon" for the Pulp Fiction soundtrack. Oh, maybe if I heard it, I would be like, "Oh yeah, I recognize." Yeah, they that. never get they never were that big. I believe they were out of Chicago. 
But mm-hmm. yeah, one of their album covers has that cemetery, and and then and there's all kinds of other lore. It's been featured in like, I guess the show Supernatural. Oh yeah, that's the CW show, I think. Yeah, I, yeah, I never watched it, but apparently there was a showdown in one of the episodes uh, that took place supposedly in that cemetery. I mean, the show was shot in Vancouver, but it was supposed to be that. They, right. I think they mentioned it on the show. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. There's all kinds of other lore that go around the cemetery. Okay. Or that floats around it. Yeah. Well, and cemeteries in general are just creepy. Mm-hmm. At night. Yeah. You know. And this one is especially, I mean, it'd be a good place to like shoot a movie or it would have been when the church was still there. Yeah. But, you know, just just a random, like all, half abandoned little mm-hmm. town, you know, in the middle of Kansas with this old timey cemetery, you know, the, the one tombstone split in half, mm-hmm. the church at the top of the hill. It just has the perfect vibe for like, okay, yeah, this is, this is a, a great place to set a horror movie. Well, there you have it. Mm-hmm. R- write it out for us, Dan. <laughs> Um, I get, I set you up with a new squish. Do you oh, see the devil. Little devil squish. Little devil. He's a very cute little devil. I know. He's got a bow tie. <laughs> he's going to like a fancy dinner down in hell. Listen, he, he's he got a hot date tonight. He's got, he's got a hot date. Hail Lucifina. Hail Lucifina. He's, he's excited to, to meet some kind of companion. I don't know. Oh my God. Maybe he's going to stole. Maybe. He supposedly got, you know, that one, uh, you know, worship follower pregnant yeah. many years oh, ago. Oh yeah. He's going back for more. Maybe. Maybe he's going for like his son's baptism. Like, right. like not not like a Catholic baptism, like some sort of Something. devil baptism. You know what I mean? I'm picturing like Elvira. <laughs> yeah. Like that look. Like maybe there's a bunch of Elvira type like goth, you know, sexy ladies hanging out in stole. Meanwhile, they hear coven. you saying this and they're getting so mad. They're like, how fucking dare you stereotype us? That's not what we look like down here. <laughs> the the hell ladies? Yeah. They're not happy with what you're saying. Well, they don't want to look like Elvira. That's a good look. I Well, it's just, you know, cliche. Oh, okay. They don't appreciate you just lumping them all together. All right. Oh, very, man. Yeah, they're very 2021 20, down there. They are. I didn't know there was outrage culture even in hell. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> I was like building this insane scenario sounds in like my an, head. Sounds like an Onion article. <laughs> It does, actually. Devil furious at being labeled, you know, (laughs) ridiculously evil, taking legal action. Oh, my God. (laughs) What a fucking legal battle that would be. People have to make public apologies for, you know, slandering the devil. Like, sorry, I guess, you know, I guess when I think about it, I I never have actually met him. Right, I I didn't think about his feelings. His passion passed along rumors and, you know, (laughs) stereotypes. (laughs) Slander accusations. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Okay, well, so as I mentioned, uh, you know, this story is about... A fan, his uh, Jay, and mm-hmm. his family, and they're all paranormal investigators. And I just was like, oh, this is, to me, I mean, if you're someone who documents this stuff and you work in this stuff, I, I don't know how much more, like, legit you could get of a story for someone yeah. to send in in terms of qualifying something. Okay. You know? Okay. You know? Um, so, I don't know. Would you ever go on a paranormal investigation? Like, with a reputable? I think I would. I think I would. You know, not just, like, some willy-nilly, someone just, just shows up is like, oh, this is what I do, but someone reputable. Yes. However yes. reputations work in that world. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. If it was, like, a, a known figure, they, yeah, they seem Like an Ed and Lorraine stable. kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Why not? You would go? I would. Wow. I'll watch video of you going. Okay. I'm not going. That'd be exciting. I think that my brain would explode. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would have such a massive meltdown. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't have know. the constitution for it. Yeah, you would probably irritate the other ghost hunters because you would because every little bump. Oh my god! Oh my god! Let's get out of here! Oh, I'd be crying. I think I'd right. be crying the whole time. Right. I'd be so scared. Okay. Well, well, let's find out what happens uh, with this family. Okay. Hello, King Creep and Queen Peeper. My Thank name is you. Dylan, but I have gone by Jay since high school. I've been an avid listener of Scared to Death since my buddy and fellow paranormal investigator Brandon introduced me in early 2020. I have believed in the paranormal since I was a young child. My parents have been paranormal investigators since before I was born, so it never really was a question for me. Hmm. This story takes place after several moves, eventually landing us in Colorado and after the birth of my younger brother, Aiden. In an apartment in northern Colorado, our family was finally settled in. My parents created a website, which is no longer up, called Ghost Hunters of Colorado, of which I was the leader of the junior division. Cool. After several cases, we were contacted by a family whose identities shall remain anonymous. This family lived in the home of a former tragedy, a cold case child abduction that took place in the 80s. Three days before the investigation, my father, a heavy sleeper in his own right, stirred from his sleep with an overwhelming feeling of dread. He lifted his head from the pillow, and as his eyes adjusted to the darkness, he looked into the corner of his room, where his eyes focused on a shadowy being. 
It was pressed into the far corner against the ceiling and met my father's eyes with an ominous yellow glow from within its own. My father sat up, staring at this creature, and began shaking my mother awake. Later, my mother would tell us that she could hear my father, she could feel him shaking her, and she heard the panic in his voice, but she could not awake from her fugue state. My father heard the creature snarl as his eyes focused on it. It was unhappy with the fact that my father could see it, as though it had been caught in the act of something. My father said that he could feel the emotions of the creature. It wasn't angry or frightened, but simply did not like that my father could see it. Suddenly, the creature dropped down to the carpeted floor and my father flicked on his bedside lamp, only to find that the creature had vanished. Mm. My father never told us any of this information until well after the investigation. Two days before the investigation, my brother, six years old at the time, stirred awake. We slept on a bunk bed, he on the top and me on the bottom. I could hear him crying as he fled the bunk bed and ran into my parents' room, waking up the whole house. He was screaming, the tarantula man is in my room. He came to take me away and I don't want to go with the spiders. Whoa. I burst into my parents' room to find them consoling him. Whatever he had seen terrified him to his core. He said that a man was next to him, his face only inches from my brother's, and it was not a human face. This man had long mandible, mandibles and pinchers like a spider and promised to take my brother to a place they could be safe in the webs. The man had several eyes which darted around in every direction as though it was constantly searching and scanning his prey. My brother slept in my parents' room the next night, leaving me alone. I was only a door away from my parents, but yet it felt too far away. Hmm. One night before the investigation... I woke up to the distinct sound of crying coming from the living room. I thought it was my mother, assuming my parents had had a fight or something. What I saw there still haunts me to this day. The living room, a room that was painted white, was now pitch black. The walls undulated and shifted around in a fashion that they couldn't possibly be. In the center of the living room, there was a girl, younger, maybe 13, with shoulder-length hair. She stared at me with black pits in her eyes and black uh. tears that ran down from her eyes into her gaping mouth, also black. She was sobbing, crying as she stared at me. This can't be real, I thought, as I began to nope the hell out of there, <laughs> until I was grabbed by my left arm. I looked to see what was holding me, but there was nothing there. The girl across the room began screaming now. As her shrieks hit my ears, the black walls began shifting and skittering about, and that's when I noticed why the walls were all black. End to end, floor to ceiling, the walls were covered in spiders, completely blotting the paint from behind it. The spiders landed on me as I frantically tried to tug my arm free. All the while, the girl begins floating towards me, passing through our table and ever closer to me. Finally, my arm broke loose and I clambered back to my room, slamming the door behind me. I brushed off the remaining spiders on my body with my back pressed against my door. Through the rest of the sleepless night, I could hear something on the other side of the door, picking at the door. It sounded like splinter after splinter was being plucked from the door. The next morning, I told my parents what I had witnessed, and my parents chalked it up to jitters due to the upcoming investigation. The night of the investigation was strangely quiet. Several hours in, we had gathered some video evidence and some EVP, and we were prepared to wrap up for the evening. However, my parents decided to try one last experiment at my expense. Mm. Hey, Dill, they said, would you be okay doing a solo investigation in the house since you're around the same age as the alleged victim? I sighed, dreading the idea of going back into the dark house by myself, but I knew that the evidence was important and that being able to bring closure to our clients is why I loved ghost hunting in the first place. As I was in the garage, I could hear indistinct mumbling. This sent terror into my very soul as I backed away, pressing my back against the garage door opposite the back door, which had a window leading to a mudroom. My eyes now fixated on this window as the whispers grew louder and louder. And then I saw her again, the girl, this time behind the window. She was just staring at me with those ominous pits for eyes. Her shoulders began to hunch upwards, followed by her hands, which she placed on the window. Her hands were larger than they should have been, like a fully grown woman's hands blackened at the fingertips as they tapped and scratched at the glass. The shadows around her were shifting and scrambling about, and then one of these shadows dropped to her face, revealing a large spider which crawled into mm. her now gaping mouth, disappearing into the darkness within her. 
I'm not ashamed to admit it. I ran. As I got outside, my breathing labored. I heard the camera around my neck power back on. None of what I had witnessed had been captured. My parents later showed me a picture of the girl that we had been there to capture on film. It was, in fact, the same girl I had seen in my living room and in the mudroom. In life, she looked like a relatively normal girl, but I couldn't help but to imagine her mouth filled with creepy crawly spiders. Much love from a lifelong creep. Keep spooping your pants, Jay. Jay. Can you, can you imagine seeing something like that intense? Oh my God. At such a young age too. I know. I know. I did have that thought because how old was he roughly? Uh, I, you know, Sorry, but he yeah. say? I, I don't mean, know. His, yeah. He just says, you know, that it started when he was young. His brother was six around this. I don't know. He's maybe like, what, like 13, 15. He actually doesn't give his age. Okay. But okay. young, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just, well, I, I'm going to guess maybe like. 15 ish because are you just letting your <laughs> right, kid but, but i don't know if maybe, that's your world right if that's your world but, but i'd be like oh my god these uh, but i guess i guess if you've grown up around that you're not going to get as spooked as easily as many kids were i mean right. i mean that would be terrible to be somebody really frightened by the paranormal right raised by just very passionate ghost hunters oh my god can you imagine just n- nightmares every night your entire childhood oh <laughs> <laughs> Bless you. Ooh, excuse me about that one. <laughs> Came out of no. I've been sneezing like crazy. And then, and then I also. Uh, oh yes, I saw you jotting down a note. Yeah, I, I just thought it was interesting how at the beginning of that story, the dark creature, and then the mom becomes kind of paralyzed. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's very reminiscent of the Stoll Cemetery Jake story. Oh it's just yeah. Inter- just interesting. We haven't had like um, shadowy creature things, you know, in a right. long, long time. And then we don't really, we don't give any details of our stories beforehand to each other. No. It's just funny that both show up today. Yeah. Well, there's going to be or more. Or it shows up in two. Yeah, both, yeah. Story, both of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just thought it was, um, I, for me, I think this overall story from Jay is just that he's been doing this his whole life. He's been surrounded by things his whole life. And for something to really stand out to bother right. him. You know, it's, to me, it's just uh, like uh, like any profession. that You do it day in and day out. So for one particular instance to stand out, it has to be fairly significant. Yeah, I wonder if they ever found the the girl that they think they're ghost. Did they, well, did yeah, they miss that? He says, Sorry. he says that they did catch um, the night of the investigation was quiet. Uh, we had gathered some video evidence and some EVP. So Oh, um, not the ghost, but, like, but but did they ever know, like, because wasn't it an abduct- abduction? Yeah, so my, my take on this is that there... The, there is a family yeah. living in a house, and the house was owned by someone else previously. And that girl yeah. was abducted. I, yeah, I, I, I says, was just kind of curious if the abducted girl had ever been found, like her well, remains. Well, I doubt it because it says this family lived in the home of a former tragedy, yeah. a cold case child abduction. Cold that t- case, so probably yeah, not. Probably so, not. So not, yeah. Yeah. Because then I just kept thinking about this poor little girl, like I know. her decomposing remains somewhere that and with the spiders and stuff. I know, I know, I know. Like, uh, uh, yeah, 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 as a yeah, parent, yeah. Oh, if, oh my god, right? Like your your biggest fear in life as a parent is that you will outlive your child, oh, and, right? And, 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 and yeah. yes, and then to expand upon yeah. that in some horrific, the, the worst. It, it's always it's always a tragedy when a parent mm-hmm. has to bury their child, but it can be amplified when it's something horrific. Yeah, that's like Max can't, tragedy. Yeah, like you can't find their body and then like you ha- like you're desperate for any sense of closure, some sort of yeah. like it's not kind of like what the lovely bones is about, you know, a little bit. So it's like, you know, you're you're trying to to find your child mm-hmm. and then you can't, but now maybe you're seeing her ghost or someone else is seeing her ghost. That's right. to me that's worse. And that's why detectives work so hard when they ca- catch some dirtbag, you know, I think of like a serial killer, mm-hmm. uh, especially when they have killed children. Mm-hmm. It's like why they are try to befriend these pieces of shit. Yeah. is uh is to give the family's closure. Yeah. You know, like why a lot of those trials happen it's just cuz that would be you would want that I would imagine so badly. You want something just to know yeah, uh, yikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Taking on a heavy note there. Let's uh, let's keep moving along. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, now this story, I, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about this. The teller of the story is sharing with us that they thought they lived in a haunted house, mm-hmm. but someone else in their life is like, I don't know if it's the house. I think it's you. And that oh, would like be, they have something attached to them. Yeah, like such a weird twist. If you yeah. okay, yeah. like you know, we're living in our house, and and sometimes I think I hear stuff in our house or what have you. But what if all of a sudden you were like, okay, so listen, mm-hmm. actually, it's you. It's you. 
you know, like, because now we live in this other place and mm-hmm. I'm still hearing things and maybe you've been witnessing the same things. Like, I I kind of went down a hole on this one. Now that you bring that up, I bet that is the situation. Yeah. And so I th- I think in the name, just, just to be logical, if yeah. things continue, you need to move out for a while. Okay. And be, be by yourself somewhere. Okay. And then report to me and the kids, like, what's going on? How scared were you today? Okay. You know, what Can things did you see today? Can I stay in a nice today? hotel? I think you should stay, I think you should stay like a weird little dark house just for a while. Okay. Just to know if it's you or our house. Just imagine you've like got me locked up in some weird shed somewhere. <laughs> so some creepy shack out like, in the woods, listen. like the corpse wood manor oh that we god. talked about, like the remains We're of something. We're running a little experiment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh my mm-hmm. god. All right. Well, here we go. I love this um, ad- address, dear defeater of smoothie guys and queen <laughs> of get the fuck out. That's an old stand-up reference for anyone confused. I know it's so great. Oh, thank you. My name is Diamond Jones. I've been a fan of dance comedy for years. And stumbled upon Scared to Death on a yes. road trip back from um, from Montana back home to Iowa. Oh, wow. Us- long road trip. Long road trip. I usually hate being scared, but I listened to the podcast the whole 15-hour drive back home. Oh, man. Driving at night. Oh. I wonder, if he, was, I wonder if he was by himself. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. Anyways, here's my story. It started off slow. Just a few dreams that woke me up in the middle of the night. The first dream seemed harmless. Just me and some friends camping. The harmless feeling came to a sudden stop when I heard the sound of my little brother screaming my name. I turned around to see him running as fast as he could with tears in his eyes. It's dad, he screamed. He needs your help. Without hesitation, I took off running. When I got to my dad, he was screaming as loud as he could. My eyes were locked onto his face. I've never seen him in so much pain. I asked my dad what was wrong, but he couldn't answer. I looked down and instantly wished I hadn't. My dad's legs were torn off his body oh and God. sitting right next to him. When I saw his legs, he stopped screaming. His, my dad is the nicest person I've ever known, but when I looked back at him, he was now smiling at me, his eyes black and what? leaning in towards me as close as he could get. I woke up sweating, sick to my stomach. I also had an overwhelming feeling that someone was watching me. Needless to say, I didn't go back to sleep that night. A few weeks later, I'd almost forgotten about my dream, but then I had another one that felt more real than the last. To this day, I don't actually know if it was a dream. I'd gotten home from work that night and I was exhausted. I ate dinner and went straight to bed. I lay there for what felt like just a few minutes when I saw the blanket that I was using as a door move. I looked up and saw the shape of a person wearing my dad's shirt and shorts, the same shirt and shorts he'd wear to bed almost every night. I assumed that he was coming to check on me. I tried to say, what's up, dad? But I couldn't speak at all. It was as if my mouth was sewn shut. Just then, my dad, or what I thought was my dad, stepped into my room. Mm -hmm. I noticed that there was a shadow that covered this thing from his shoulders to the top of his head. I was struggling to talk when this thing started creeping closer to me. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. It moved towards me and put its face, or lack thereof a face, I should say, inches away from mine. Finally, I was able to scream stop, and as the words rushed out of my mouth, the thing vanished. The next day, I told no one about what had happened, convinced it was just sleep paralysis and that I had nothing to worry about. Then a few days later, my sister and I were talking about weird dreams that we'd had. When I told her about my experience, her eyes got wide and her face went pale. She stuttered as she told me she had had the exact same experience when that was her room that she had moved out of just months before I moved into it. She continued to tell me that when I was younger, I would tell my family about people I could see, but that no one in my family could see. She also told me that she didn't experience anything weird in any house that we ever lived in unless I was there. She said that she didn't think the houses we lived in were haunted, but rather she thinks I am the one who's haunted. I laughed thinking she was just trying to scare me. Thankfully, we moved soon thereafter. When we moved out of that house, I was so happy. Our new house wasn't far from the old house, but it was far enough away. Hmm. I walked around the house before we moved in to see if I could feel any negative energy anywhere, but there was nothing. For a while, I lived peacefully in this house. I had an actual door with a lock, which I used every night, just in case I had that dream again. If I saw something peeking at me from the door, I would remember my door was shut and locked and tell myself it was just a dream in an an attempt to maybe feel a bit more comfortable. 
As it turns out, demons don't give a shit if your door is locked <laughs> or not. I was lying on my bed watching YouTube videos on my phone one night when I fell asleep. I woke up to my bed violently shaking. My one arm was hanging off the side of the bed and my wrist felt like it was freezing cold. I opened my eyes and saw the same thing, wearing my dad's shirt and shorts, grabbing onto my wrist and pulling on me as hard as he could. The lights were on in my room, but there was somehow still a shadow over his face. I fought as hard as I could, and as I pulled my hands away from his grip, I reached for my covers and pulled them over my head. I was trying so hard to wake myself up from what I thought was a bad dream, but then I felt this thing jump on top of me. It was so heavy, I couldn't breathe. It started punching me in the ribs and the legs and anywhere it could make contact. I desperately covered my face. I was thinking it was going to kill me. I thought I have to fight or I'm going to die. So I closed my hands into a tight fist, pulling back the covers to reveal that there was nothing there. I sat up in bed. Oh, my, my door was still closed and further inspection found it still locked. The next day I told my sister everything. She was obviously scared by what I told her. I tried to crack some jokes about it to make her feel better. She got upset with me poking fun. You need to take this seriously, she shouted at me. But I didn't want to take it seriously. I didn't want it to be real. I just kept joking. Oh, excuse me, ghost, I said. Did you follow me from my old house because you love me? And at that very moment, the lights flickered as if to say yes. We need to get the fuck out of this house, my sister said. I thought about it and agreed with her. I grabbed my coat, and as we were running out the door, we both heard a voice echo throughout the house. I will follow you. What? It said. My sister and I were speechless, and before that, and right, my sister and I were speechless just before my sister broke into tears. Seeing her cry infuriated me, and so I broke the silence and screamed in the air, fuck you, bitch. <laughs> and in that very instant, the feeling my sister and I had that we were not alone vanished. Is that it? I thought to myself, is it gone? A year went by with nothing. No voices, no dreams, what? but I'm not the same. I have horrible insomnia, and most nights I don't sleep until about 3 a.m., and some nights I just don't sleep at all. My last encounter with this thing was just a few weeks ago. I was getting a ride to work with my uncle after not sleeping the night before. As we were driving down the freeway, we started to pass the car in front of us. I looked at the guy driving and immediately wanted to throw up. He wasn't watching the road. He was staring at me, black eyes and a wide smile, exactly how my dad had smiled what? at me in my first yeah. dream. I didn't want to believe it. It's not what you think it is, I said to myself. He's just some weirdo. Just when I started to believe myself, my uncle and I pulled into a small town, and I began to see the black eyes and smiles everywhere, on every face. People on the sidewalk, people in their cars, just everyone. My uncle had pulled into the hardware store parking lot. Do you want to go in with me? He asked. I shook my head no. I didn't want to find out what would happen if I got out of the truck. Okay, my uncle said as he closed the door behind himself. I locked the truck doors and watched him walk through the sliding doors into the store. Just as quickly as they closed, the doors opened again and an old man walked out. I watched him walk to his truck parked right next to ours. He turned his back to me and lowered his head to focus on putting his keys in the door to unlock it. He lifted his head and whipped it around to face me. His eyes were fucking black and he was grinning at me ear to ear. Through the door, I heard him say, every time you forget about me or think I'm gone, I will come back. And then he reared his head back and slammed his face into my window. The old man's eyes went back to normal in an instant and he looked around confused. He looked at me and saw how horrified I was as his nose started to gush blood. I'm so sorry, he said, and then he got into his car and drove off, drove off as fast as he could. Sincerely, Diamond. That's a creepy story. I was reading this story and it was like that ending mm -hmm. that just like fucking did me in. The scariest part to me was uh, the thought I, I, I got distracted by. My mind was just going with the... Uh, how terrifying that would be if you're driving down the road. Oh, my God. You're passing a car. You look over, and the driver of the other car is not paying attention to the road at all. They're looking right at you oh. for a prolonged period of time with, like, dark eyes, some kind of warped face. Ooh. Weak. That is a terrifying thought. What did me was the old man just at the smashing. end smashing, yeah, rah. and and then like you know like goes from like dark eyes smile mm -hmm, to like an old mm -hmm. man confused, bloody nose. 
And weird about the dad. Like, what's going on with him and his, like... I know. I mean, I mean possibly very, absolutely nothing between right. him and his dad. Right. But, um, yeah. Uh-huh. Geek, geek, geek. Glad it's not happening that to me. Some, that gave me some good chills. I, I, I really got the chills of um, thinking about the person driving the car. Ugh. Da, 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 da. Ah, good stuff. I know, really. Thanks, Diamond. Thank, no, not Diamond. Diamond. D-I-E-M-A-N. Diamond. Oh, no, D at the end. Got it. Diamond. Yeah. Got it. Diamond. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's actually spelled like D-I-A-M-A-N-N, but the phonetic. Right. I was just going to roll with Diamond. Well, I don't think that Diamond would appreciate that. Right, right. But, but I'm just saying, like, looking back, that is kind of yeah. weird that I would just not bump on, like, yeah, it's just Diamond. <laughs> diamond is Sister Ruby. His, uh, his father, listen, Sapphire. Listen, some people's name is Ruby. Ruby, 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 True, Ruby's Ruby. Ruby. I guess it would be, yeah, if it was like Diamond and Ruby Sister Tuesdays. Emerald. Yeah. That would be more uncommon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some people might name their kids like Amethyst. This is my little brother Gold Dust. Oh, I want to be Gold Dust. You want to be Gold Dust? Hell yeah. Okay, you could be Gold Dust. I'll be, I don't know, I'll be Gold Nugget and you can be Gold <laughs> Dust. <laughs> Old Nugget and Dust. That doesn't sound good. weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'd be more like Tourmaline. What is, what is Tourmaline? It's a black thing. It's a black crystal. Like, like, it's, like it's associated with like darkness or something? Well, I don't want to get into it. Because oh, you're just mm. going to poo-poo it. Oh, you know okay. what I mean? What's the point? Okay. What is the point? It's like the yin and the yang. You need black and white, light and dark. Is that what we are? Are you the light and I'm the dark? Mm-hmm. Hmm, okay. You know that. I probably do. Yeah. Just admit it. All right. Fine. Okay. There we go. Do you have some Annabelle shout outs that you want to do, Dan? <laughs> I do. I have, Ch- yeah, thank you to the following Annabelles for, for support and scared to death. Yes. Uh, Chase Little John. Blair Sadowski, Kathleen King, Randolph, and it's Orts, but it, I, I want to say Ortiz. I want to put an I in there, but it might just be Orts. I know. I I re-looked it up in the Patreon because mm-hmm. sometimes I'll be like, oh, gosh, is that the right spelling? Mm-hmm. Okay, Randolph Orts. Nothing wrong with Orts. Uh, Outcast for Life, Austin Hayes, uh, <laughs> Shy and Tristan Buck, The Mad Irishman, uh, Becky Van Witchen, and Daniel Van Sloan. Some good names this week. Mm-hmm. Yes, I would like to say thank you to Annabelle's Aaron Poe, Sierra Roach, Scott Maiden, Butch Amos, Sarah McBrarity, Cameron Hicks, Kyler Linden Smith, Logan Luna, which I love that name, mm-hmm. Chris Wade, and Carrie Stone. Butch Amos sounds like uh, some kind of outlaw country star. I knew you were going to go there. Mm-hmm. Just going on tour with Butch Amos. And Buck Fitch. And, yeah, Buck Fitch from my childhood. Rest in peace, Buck. Yeah, Buck Fitch yeah, recently passed away. Um, and, and I want to thank everybody for the reviews and ratings. Again, uh, we really appreciate it. We see those they, they keep coming in, and we are fans of the ratings and reviews. And I know you have birthday shout-outs. But yes. spoo- you have spoopy shout-outs. Spoopy shout-outs, Dan. Mm-hmm. All right. A little spoopy shout-out to Liv from Cassie. Happy third wedding anniversary. To Zach, uh, I'm sorry, to Zach from Jenny, I love you. Happy wedding day. They're getting married on Sunday. Oh, congrats. I know. Very exciting. To McKaylin from Nick, love you. To Dee and Caden from Cody, he also loves you. To Colin from Sarah, happy birthday. And to Billy Joe, a.k.a. my, let's see if I can get this right, my pulchritudinous, I, I don't know what that means. Hmm. I have no idea. From Jer Bear, happy birthday. Jer Bear. Jer Bear and Billy Joe. <laughs> Billy Joe and Jer Bear. Come on. Is it any cuter than that? Open it up for Butch Amos on <laughs> tour this fall. Oh, my God. I love it. Uh, I hope that Butch Amos really is some sort of musician. Uh, the, Butch, the, if you are, let us right. know. If you're, not, if you're not, give your name to somebody else. Yeah. Trade, you, tra- trade names with somebody. Ooh, if you're not, pick up a guitar. Why right. does he have to give his name away? He could just pick up a new talent. True. He could learn Man. the talent. But have it, some faith in people. But if he's not, if there's some country artist out there with like a... Uh, I'm trying to think of some non-country name, you know, mm-hmm. uh, T- Talbot, you know, Winthersall. That's not very country. Well, Blake Shelton isn't very country. I guess it's all the association, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's just what you conjure up in your mind. Oh, oh man. Like Alan Jackson. Come on. I was trying to think of a very waspy name, and I just think I made up some gibberish words. Oh, a very waspy name would mm-hmm. be like... Um, Ruther- Rutherford. Ooh. Rutherford Abercrombie. Not a good country name. The third. The third. Butch Amos, way better. <laughs> All right. Well, Butch, what was it? Rutherford Abercrombie. What's, like, what's a nickname for that? Like, Ruddy? <laughs> a douche. <laughs> ah, come on. Oh, my God. I'll, uh, I have a story for you later about a really, really, really douchey name. This guy, yeah. Oh, my uh, God. We, that is it for us today. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. 
And thanks to Logan Keith on social media. And Logan Keith. <laughs> and for doing the BadMagicMerch.com design. Store at BadMagicProductions.com for customer service. Producer Sophie Evans for help with story curation. We had Zach Flannery producing directing today. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Thanks, thanks to Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation. And Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch and not just listen. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want, you know, more content and to see the pictures associated with the shows at Scared to Death Podcast. And we have a private Facebook group, Griefs and Peepers, over 13,000 horror lovers now. Uh, thanks to Liz Hernandez for moderating. Check out our Patreon if you want the catalog ad-free bonus episodes, access to the This Looks Awesome Horror Movie Club, and more 20% of your patrons also goes to charity. Mm-hmm. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps, and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death.